Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and turn to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Romans 1 for our scripture reading. We're going to read verses 14, 15, and 16. We'll read 14 together. I'll read 15, and then we'll end together reading verse 16 of Romans chapter 1. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 14. Ready? I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you for preserving your words for us that we hold copies in our hands tonight. And Lord, we have enjoyed the music. We have enjoyed immensely the testimonies tonight from Brother Jason and others here in the church of your goodness and your faithfulness. And uh, yet, Lord, we desire to hear from your word this evening. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll bless the special and that, Lord, it will prepare our hearts, that it will be good ground that the Word of God can fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope to you. For in his light you'll never walk alone. Always feel at home wherever you may roam. There is no power can conquer you while God is on your side. Just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for, again, what we've already heard tonight. Thank you, Lord, that you desire to, to minister to each one of us. We're thankful, Lord, for it's no secret what God can do. And Lord, convince us tonight that what you've done for others, you'll do for us. And I pray, God, that you'll speak to us now through your word. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do here in these next few moments that we spend together. <clears throat> I realize it's warm tonight and, and folks are going to need your help to listen and to not miss 
uh, the, the truth that we'd like to share this evening from Romans chapter 1. So help us as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 1, if your Bible's open there, I'm going to try and not be long. You should know, however, I don't always accomplish what I try to do, and, um, but I am going to try to be shorter tonight for you. I know it's warm in here. I think there's something going on with uh, the units that isn't quite right, but we'll try to get that figured out. It may just be that it's too hot, and <laughs> but that'll change too, amen? So uh, that's all right. Romans chapter 1, three times in... Paul's writings, he mentions the word debtor, or debtors. And, and by the way, all of us are debtors. Uh, we are certainly all debtors to God. Uh, for God's love, for God's mercy, for God's grace, for God's forgiveness, for all that God has done for us. But three times Paul mentions this word debtor. The first time is where we read this evening, I'm debtor both to the Greeks, the barbarians, to the wise, and to the unwise. The second time... He mentions it is in Romans 8 and verse number 12 where he said, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. And he's saying what we're debtors is is to live after the Spirit. Okay. The third time he mentions it is in Romans 15 and verse number 27. And in there he's saying it pleased them verily that... Uh, and they're debtors they are. He's talking about the offering that was given to the saints in Jerusalem. And he's simply saying that uh, the saints in Jerusalem are debtors to you. In other words, they, they owe you that debt. And they owe you and they ought to repay their debt. But Paul's going to tell us then, I think in these passages, that uh, whom he owes the debt to. And he's going to tell us what he owes as a debt. And he tells us to whom he ought to pay the debt. And I want us to just look at that briefly this evening. First of all, to whom he owes the debt. He says, I am debtor uh, both to the Greeks and barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. And as, a Paul would, as Paul would write this and the Lord would give him the words to write that I am debtor, I, I, I think that if I think about the Apostle Paul's life and I think about even his life before he became Paul and he was Saul, that that there would be people he'd owe a debt to. And I would think one of those men would be Stephen. As Stephen was stoned, if you remember in the book of Acts, chapter 7, uh, after he preaches the message, and they, they're, they're so angry at him about the message, and then they're so angry about what he said about crucifying Jesus Christ, they, they want to take up stones and stone him. But in order to do that, they take their coats off. And when they take their coats off, the Bible says they laid their coats at a young man's feet named Saul. And he's watching their coats while these men pick up stones and kill Stephen. And, and as Saul watches Stephen, I think he watches, he sees the face of Stephen, the Bible says, as it were the face of an angel. He hears Stephen say, Father, forgive them. He hears them say, lay not this sin to their charge. I'll guarantee you, he never saw anyone die like that. I guarantee you, he never heard that from the lips of someone who was being pelted with stones. And that left such an impression on that young man. I don't think he ever got over it. I really believe in, in Acts 9 when the Lord Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. I think it's the pricking of his conscience. And I think what he saw that day in Stephen, I'm not sure he ever got over. Don't ever underestimate your testimony. And, and, and though someone may not seem like it means anything to them or it hasn't affected them at all, my friend, you never know what the Spirit of God will use in their heart and their life. I think he owed a debt to Stephen. I think he owed a debt to Ananias. Uh, would you look back at Acts chapter 9? Acts 9 is where Paul is, Saul is converted on the road to Damascus. And... Most of you know when he got saved and, and born again there, he was without sight. He was struck blind. The Bible says he rose from the earth in verse 8. His, his eyes were open and he saw no man. They led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither to eat, drink, eat or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus, verse 10, named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. 
And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. This is an amazing thing. And Ananias is kind of reminding God, isn't it funny how we remind God of stuff when we pray? <laughs> like, like God said, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, he goes, he, he, he's trying to say, now this guy has authority to arrest people, you know, and uh, I'd be one of those people, God. And uh, he says, hey, you go, uh, everything's going to be all right. And the amazing thing is, verse 17, Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, what's the next two words, church? Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Boy, it's no, no examination. No, I'm going to watch you for a while. I'm going to make sure this is real. I'm going to check it out. He just said, God says, if God says you're okay, then you're okay. That's basically what all, it, what all it amounted to. He said, I'm going to call you brother, Brother Saul. And that's why we call each other brother. Uh, we're part of the family of God. And here he is, helps him get baptized, uh, helps him in these early days of a Christian life. Uh, you think about how important those early days are of someone who just gets saved. How important it is to surround himself with the right people. And here's Ananias, a very important in the life of Saul, who eventually will become Paul. And uh, I think, I think Saul would say, Paul would say, I owe a debt to Ananias for him coming to me and putting his hand on me and saying, Brother Saul, for baptizing, getting me baptized, and for teaching me some of the things of God early in my Christian life. But then there's another fellow who he'd owe a debt to, and that would be a guy named Barnabas. Barnabas. Barnabas was in Christ before Saul was in Christ. And, and later on in chapter 9, you're still there in Acts chapter 9, um, there are a lot of threats for Paul or Saul still in Damascus. And, and it says uh, some people were going to take counsel to kill him in verse 23. And verse 24, their lying in wait was known of Saul and they watched his gates day and night to kill him. And verse 25, the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he had stayed to join himself to disciples. So they get him out of Damascus because they're trying to kill him for preaching Christ. And, and now he goes to Jerusalem. Well, certainly they're going to be glad to see him. Not so much. Okay? And notice what happened. They get to Jerusalem and they brought him, uh, uh, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Oh, they weren't welcoming at all. But Barnabas took him, verse 27, and brought him to the apostles. And declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. I had spoken to him and how he preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so here's Saul, his ministry begins. But it begins because Barnabas. When the apostle says, no way, we're afraid. Of you. We're not having anything to do with you. Barnabas said, come here. Barnabas took him. And then Barnabas had enough influence with the apostles that they received him. And they took him in. Later on in Acts chapter 11, you remember the story when a revival breaks out down in Antioch and many people are getting saved. The church of Jerusalem figures, who can we send down there to check this out? And they said, well, let's send Barnabas. He's the encourager. And uh, we'll send down. And of course, Barnabas went down there and he encouraged them that they would continue faithful to the Lord and cleave to the Lord. And as a result of that, more people got saved in Antioch. And Barnabas says, man, this is really happening. Things are going on. And he says, I'm going to go find Saul. And he leaves and he goes and finds Saul and he brings them back. They don't go back to Jerusalem. They come back to Antioch. And in Acts chapter 11, in, in verse number 26, it says, when he found him, that's Saul, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. For a whole year, Barnabas teams up with Saul and they teach in the church in Antioch. What a year that must have been for that church. And uh, they team up together to, to teach and preach there. And, and he would owe a debt 
to Barnabas. They begin to travel. You remember in the first missionary journey, the first missionaries called out of the church at Antioch, Barnabas and Saul. And they go out, and you read about it. We won't take time tonight to go, go through the Scripture, but you see it's, as they go out, it's Barnabas. When he names the list of teachers in the church, the first guy mentioned was Barnabas. Well, he's the oldest. He's been in the church. He goes all the way back to early part of Jer Church of Jerusalem there in Acts chapter 4. That's where you first meet Barnabas. So he's been in this thing quite a long time. He'd get the head billing, okay? And uh, you don't go too far into that missionary journey until you find things begin to turn around. And it's no longer Barnabas and Saul, but it's Paul and Barnabas. But you never read about Barnabas getting upset about that. You never read about Barnabas saying, hey, bud, I was in this thing before you were. Barnabas steps back, and he realizes what God's going to do with this young man named Paul. And he pushes him up and says, you, you're, you're the one. And, and by the way, even after on the second trip when they had that dissension about John Mark, and, and they had a, such a dissension and, and disagreement about it that uh, Paul said, fine, uh, I'll take Silas and you stay here and take John Mark. And he took John Mark and they sailed a different way and they didn't go on the second missionary journey. That was Paul and Silas, not Paul and Barnabas anymore. But you know what? He took John Mark and... And later on, when Paul writes 2 Timothy, he, he sends for John Mark. He says, bring John Mark here. He's profitable to me for the ministry. John Mark would still want to work with Paul? After Paul said, I'm not taking that quitter with me again? Huh? You mean now he's still... How, you know how he could do that? Because Barnabas didn't badmouth him. I guarantee you, he didn't take, he didn't take John Mark and go on a journey and, and then talk about Paul the whole way. How unreasonable he was. And how mean spirit he was. And how unwilling he is to give a guy another chance. And boy, what kind of a guy he's never going to have a ministry to mount. No, 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 no. Barnabas, Barnabas didn't do any of that. He just taught him and encouraged him and built him up in the faith and still built Paul up in the faith as well. And later on, guess what? John Mark's going to help him and be a blessing to him. He owes a lot to Barnabas. He owed a debt to Barnabas. He owes a debt to Ananias. I think he owes a debt to Stephen in in. Uh, Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm debtor. Uh, notice what he said. I'm debtor to the Greeks. Why would he be a debtor to the Greeks? You ever think about that? Well, that's the, how, how many of you know what's the predominant language the New Testament was written in? Greek. It was written in Greek. It was preached in, and that's the language the gospel was first written in. It was the universal tongue of their day. All the civilized world heard it, and all the civilized world would have gotten the word of God when they received it at the hands of the Greeks. So Paul says, I'm a debtor to the Greeks. What about the Romans? Now, the Romans had the Roman Empire. The Romans built the roads that he could travel on to be able to take the gospel to every creature and take the gospel. It was a, it was a world of law and order and justice and the intercommunication between people in between areas that was all because of Rome so he would be a debtor to the Romans he would be a debtor to the Jew by the way we all are debtors to the Jews if it weren't for the Jews uh, we don't have a savior uh, we don't have the son of God who comes through the Jews and so we owe a great debt to the Jews someone asked the other day why why do we have to favor the Jews and why do we have to be for the Jews because God said I'll bless them that bless thee and I'll curse them that curse thee. And the Bible says in the book of Psalms, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Uh, and if that's all we had to go on, that would be enough right there. But there's plenty in the Bible about what we owe a debt to the Jews. And, and, and so he's a debtor. But you and I are debtors as well. We're all debtors. I'm a debtor tonight to a dad that made sure I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I don't, I don't remember a time in my life when, when my father didn't take us to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Don't, don't, don't ever think that, oh, take my kids to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They won't want to go when they get older. Uh, no, they may turn out to be preachers. They may turn out to marry a preacher like my sister did. Okay? Don't ever think that that's the wrong thing to do. That's the right thing to do. I owe a debt to my dad for having a paper come into our house. It was called the Sword of the Lord. And uh, that, that periodical came to our house and, and I, I, I got to read messages and see sermons by Dr. John R. Rice and 
got to see messages by Dr. Jack Hiles. Many a Sunday morning with a radio on in the bathroom was a radio program out of Hammond, Indiana, uh, hearing Jack Hiles. In those days, their Sunday school was simply an interview. He'd interview couples that had got saved that week. And, and they would give their testimony about how they came to know Christ and would hear that on the radio and got to be familiar with Lester Roloff and Lee Robertson. And uh, Lester Roloff was in our home when he traveled with some of the girls. They, they came to a stadium not far from our house, and we kept a couple of the girls uh, in our home. And uh, he came over to check on them. And never forget, he just, he just came in the back door and walked right in. Didn't knock, didn't do anything, just walked in, went to the refrigerator, went to the, the, the freezer, opened it up, and uh, had the, the, the ice cube trays in those days. You didn't have the thing in the door. You know what I mean? That, that wasn't it. You had the tray where either you had the plastic and you had to twist it or you had that little handle there and you had to flip that handle. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, some of you old timers in here, all right? If you're, probably un, if, you're, if you're under 30, you probably think, what are you talking about? But there was a day, my friend. I won't go into it. But um, we, and, and he had got an ice cube and just started chewing an ice cube and talking to everybody. A uh, unique, unique man. And I, I, I'm, I'm a debtor to that kind of an upbringing. I'm debtor to a little country church in Hartville, Ohio. To Henry Bessie and Lynn Bessie. Names that you would never know. Who faithfully preached the word of God. Used to have notebook, an uh, eight and a half by eleven notebook where I just, I, I took notes. Wrote down sermons while they preached. Uh, just, I'm talking as a six and a seven and an eight year old boy. Uh, writing down those sermons, uh, faithfully preaching the Word of God. I'm debtor to an evangelist named Walt Hoover and Bill Halad who came and held a revival meeting at the church. And that was the, the, on a Sunday night I got saved. Uh, got convicted and uh, talked to my dad on a Sunday afternoon after dinner. Crawled up in his lap, talked to him. I was six years old and, and, and he explained a little more about salvation to me and he said, well, if you're still concerned about it, then tonight during the invitation you go forward. And, and probably a wise thing, thinking as a six-year-old boy I'll get distracted with something else and won't think about it anymore. And, but boy, God was weighing heavy on my heart. And boy, that night I slipped out of my seat. I came right down and knelt at the second chair on the left-hand side. And uh, Bill Halad knelt down with his Bible and showed me how I could know I'm going to heaven when I died. And prayed and asked Christ to be my Savior. On Sunday night? Boy, thank, hey, I'm a debtor to Sunday night church. Thank God there was a place that had a Sunday night service. I'm debtor to Sunday school teachers. Jake Hirschberger was my first Sunday school teacher. Hey, it was Hartville, Ohio. You're either a Hirschberger or Yoder or Miller. You know what I mean? That's just all there was. Amen. And Jake Hirschberger. And then later on in my junior high years, I had a Sunday school teacher named Bob Lamb. And uh, Bob's faithful had a blessing of, uh, Let's see, 12 years ago, just after I became pastor here, I met him up in Akron, Ohio, and uh, got to have lunch with him and, and let him know what an impact he made in my life as a junior high boy because Bob Lamb what, loved God. I mean, he drove the church bus, cleaned the church. He bought a house next door to the church. He was just involved, but he was an athlete. Played basketball, played baseball, played could all that stuff. Talked about, named his son, Brother Lindemann, he named his son Hank after Hank Aaron. I mean, it was unbelievable, you know, and, I, and that was just, that, that's who I needed in my life at that time. Somebody who was an athlete and interested in sports, but loved God, and a uh, great influence in my life. I'm debtor to Mel Sabaka, who was the, at that time, the college and career pastor at Canton Baptist Temple. And when I went there, I, I wasn't of that age, but that's the class I went into. I don't know if you knew that or not, Brother Yoder. Um, but that's where he was the man who, who taught me that, that book right there that you have, a King James Bible, that that's God's Word. That that's God's preserved Word for us. And I learned that from him uh, as a junior in high school. And, and the reason I was there was the fellow who, came in, who, who first met my family and came to our house after we visited Camp Baptist Temple was a guy named Rod Stuchel. And uh, Dave, Dave knows who I'm talking about. And... Uh, <clears throat> Rod came and well, after that first Tuesday night visitation when he visited my house Rod came and got me for everything I mean he got me for Tuesday night visitation and Thursday night in those days they had a Bible discussion at the activities building uh, Mel Sabaka supervised that and just a, a big building much like the fellowship hall a little bit larger and they just have tables set up in a 
in a horseshoe type thing and or all the way around and and people sat there people come in from colleges a lot of secular colleges around there and uh, they would ask questions and Mel wouldn't answer the questions he would ask the guys in the class who can answer that and go to the scriptures and he'd guide and supervise a little bit but he wanted he wanted his young people his college degree young people to be able to answer the questions from God's word and uh, learned a lot of things 8 p.m. To 11 p.m. and oftentimes it was 11:30 or so on Thursday nights, and and I mean, uh, oftentimes anywhere uh, 60, sometimes 80, 100 kids over there uh, for Bible study on a Thursday night. Uh, didn't have the, the, uh, nothing to eat. Uh, yeah, there was a Coke machine. You could buy Coke if you wanted to, and you sip a Coke and you studied the Bible for three hours, and it went by like that. Just amazing. But he picked me up for that, basketball, uh, softball on Monday nights, uh, youth rallies, anything it was, he would come get me. Oh, I owe a debt to Rod Stuchel. Been a good friend through the years. Dr. Henniger was the pastor when I was attending there, and what a thriving church we got to experience growing up. Uh, Forty bus routes. Remember Sunday coming to church, seeing all those buses lined up. At the back lot of the church. Just an amazing thing. Forty buses. They were, say, on, on a normal Sunday, Brother Martin, there, there'd be 4,000. Uh, on Easter, special Sundays, easily over 5,000 people there. Just amazing. Amazing to see. Amazing ministry that Dr. Henniger was used there. Where I got to hear guys like Tom Malone and got to hear Fred Brown and got to hear A.B. Henderson, B.R. Lakin. Got to hear some great preachers uh, through the years. But you know what? You owe a debt too. You owe a debt to whoever knocked on your door. You owe a debt to the person who invited you to come to church and was concerned about your soul. The parents who maybe brought you up in church, you owe a debt to them that they brought you to the house of God. You owe a debt to your Sunday school teachers who've taught you the Word of God through the years, to pastors that have faithfully taught you God's Word to maybe a bus worker that kept coming after you and making sure you got into church and that you stayed in church. But not only do you owe a debt to them, hey, today, mom and dad, you owe a debt to the person who teaches your child in Sunday school today. You owe a debt to those who teach your children in children's church today. You owe a debt to the, children, to the, to the ladies who watch your children in nursery for the services. See, as good as, as good as this service was tonight and as great it was to hear all the testimonies, somebody has to miss it because they have to watch children down in the nursery. Okay? You have to understand. There's, there's nobody, sometimes ladies feel bad because they feel like, well, I, I don't really want to be in the nursery. Nobody does. I mean, who wants to choose to miss the service? Nobody would choose to do that, but somebody's got to do it. Or we wouldn't have the service we would have. We wouldn't get over the noise and, and the distractions. And everything that goes on. So thank, thank God for those who take care of the children. We owe a debt. We owe a debt to godly people tonight. Do you understand that? But not only do we owe a debt and who we owe the debt to, what is the debt we owe? Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 12. Are you all right? You okay? Romans 8 verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. So we're debtors not to live after the flesh. The works of the flesh are listed for us in Galatians 5, 19 and 21. And, and listen, none of it's good. Now you read it and talk about adulteries and envies and murders and drunkenness and, and immorality and all the list goes on. It's, it's nothing good. It's only things that will bring death. And God says, we're not debtors uh, to, to, to live after the flesh. We're debtors to live after the Spirit. I owe a debt to those people who've gone before me. I owe a debt to those people that have invested in my life to live a spiritual life. To live a life after the Spirit and not after the flesh. To live a life saying, I want to do what God tells me to do, not just what I want to do. I owe that debt to them that I live a life listening to the Spirit of God and following His direction. I owe it to those people in my life not to drink liquor. I owe it to those people in my life not to smoke dope. I owe it to those people not to smoke or chew tobacco. 
I owe it to these people who've invested in my life to read my Bible and study my Bible and memorize my Bible and meditate in the Bible and to grow in the Lord and to live the Bible I know and to pray and to know God and to tell others about Christ and to live a life of holiness before Him. I owe a debt to them that I need to pay by living for the Spirit and not living after the flesh. Parents, children, your parents bring you up in church. You owe a debt to them. You owe a debt to them to be in your Bible. You owe a debt to them to be in church when the doors are open. You owe a debt to them to look like a Christian and walk like a Christian and talk like a Christian and act like a Christian and be a Christian through and through. We owe a debt to those who've invested in our lives that we live as God tells us we ought to live. We owe them a godly, spiritual life. Listen, this, this idea of living for God is, is not something you do. It is something you are. It is, it is not just something I'm doing because that's what I'm supposed to do. It's something I'm being. What manner of persons ought ye to be? Be spiritual. Be after the Spirit. Not just something you're performing. It's something that's who you are from the inside out. To whom do we owe a debt? Those who've invested in our lives. To what do we owe? We owe them a godly spiritual life. To whom do I pay the debt? You pay the debt in service to others. You pay the debt in service to others. They preach the gospel to me. I preach the gospel to you. They, they, they preach the Word of God to me, I preach the Word of God to you. They live a holy life for me, and before me, I want to live a holy life before you. They, 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 they shared the gospel with me, they told me how to go out and to win someone else to Christ, I want to share the gospel with you and teach you how to go win someone else to Christ. Sold out for God. You owe that debt in service for others. You know, we owe a debt at Bible Baptist Church to the families who went on before us. We owe a debt to the Myers who started the church. The Ames. Mentioned Brother Ames this morning. I think Brother Hamby got saved. Brother Eddie Hamby, who's an evangelist, he, he got saved under Brother Ames when he was here. Brother Ames was the one who brought Bible Baptist Church to be an independent Baptist church. I think they were... Uh, G-A-R-B-C, General Association of Regular Baptist Churches up to that point. And by, by the way, those were good churches back in those days. Brother Rock, he came here out of Tennessee Temple. He trained under Lee Robertson and brought that here to the church and served faithfully for so many years. The Richardson family, the Kaufman family, the Hambys, the Talladays, the pole labels, stood for the Bible, stood for soul winning, stood for standards, stood for bus routes, stood for faithfulness. We, we can't forget that. I've been here 12 years, but the church has been here 62 years. Some of you have been here 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 years. But it was still here before you came. There's nobody here that says, I was here when she started. Somebody back yonder uh, had, to, had to get this thing going. Somebody had to meet together. Somebody had to, to, to build a building and take care of it. And, and listen, somebody, had to, somebody built this auditorium. Somebody built these buildings that we get to enjoy now. Some, I, I, would, I would venture to say that some uh, probably gave to the building and gave to the building fund who maybe never got to enjoy the building. Why did they do it? They did it so we'd enjoy it tonight. So we have a place to meet tonight. Think about that. When Bob stands up and says, all right, let's turn to him such and such and sing this, you realize he didn't write the song? He didn't write that hymn? I didn't write the hymn? The songs we sing, hey, somebody gave them to us. Somebody 
uh, uh, wrote those songs back in their day. In, the, in, the, in, in ages past, some, some of them hundreds of years ago. And, and, and the, the book we have, we didn't write it. Forty different men over a period of 1,600 years wrote that book. They, 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 as God spoke to them, they wrote down His words. So we have copies of it now. A lot of things, the, the prophets of the Old Testament, they, they, they would like to look into some of these things they were writing about. They didn't fully understand it. But we have the whole book. We get to understand that. We're debtors. We're debtors to be able to meet freely tonight. What if, what, if your church, what if our church was in Moscow or Peking? It would be a whole different scenario. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't give the testimonies tonight like we did. Broadcast it over the Internet for everybody to hear across the world. wouldn't happen that way. We get to meet here uh, without fear. We get to meet here freely. Why? We owe a debt to some people who gave their lives so we could still worship freely tonight. We're debtors. We're debtors. To live after the Spirit. To give our lives in service for others. We owe, we owe the debt now that we keep serving. We owe the debt now that we keep reaching others for Christ. We owe the debt now that we keep tending missionaries around the world. That we continue to get the gospel to people. That we continue to pay our debt. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be, that I may live for others, that I may live like Thee. Others. What's those cards about on the table back there? It's all about others. All about others. You know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a harmful thing at all to say, you know what we're going to do? We're going we're gonna to shave a couple hundred dollars off our Christmas list this year and make sure the missionaries have a Christmas. Make sure the missionaries get some of their needs met. Rather than us getting more stuff that we have to pile up somewhere. More stuff that we'll have to either have a garage sale or go rent a storage shed for. Hmm? Don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. Hmm? Let God be magnified. Why? We owe a debt. We owe a debt. And we ought to pay our debts. Amen? I want to pay my debt. I intend to pay the debt I owe. Let me ask you a question this evening. Who do you owe a debt to? Who do you owe a debt to in your life? What do you owe them? You owe them a godly life. You owe them to live after the Spirit, not after the flesh. How do you pay it? You pay it in service for others. Living as God would have you to live. The question is, will you pay it? Are you paying it? Who are... Who are you investing in? Who, who's, whose life are you pouring yourself into that'll live on? Brother Ames, I'm guessing. I don't know for sure. I think he's in heaven. But he looks over the banister of heaven. I think he's got to be pretty pleased when he sees uh, Eddie Hamby. Serving God as an evangelist. Amen. Preaching the gospel, seeing souls saved. Who are you investing in? Can I say this tonight? If you're here tonight without Jesus Christ, you owe a debt. And it's a debt you can't pay. <laughs> you owe a debt you can't pay because that, death will be de that debt will be death and that death will be in hell. Separated from God forever. But I got good news for you. Uh, you can't pay the debt, but somebody has paid it for you. And that somebody was Jesus Christ. He paid the debt for you when He died on the cross on Calvary. And if you'll accept Him as your Savior, what He's done for you on the cross, 
and say, I believe you paid my sin debt for me, Jesus, and I'm going to receive what you've done for me, and I receive you as my Savior. He'll give you the gift of eternal life. And you know what God does about your sin debt? He, he takes his big stamp and it says paid in full. And he stamps it in red right across your account. And Jesus pays it in full because of his death on the cross. But tonight I just wanted to, I, I, just, I just got to thinking about those words, I'm a debtor. Paul realized who he owed. And I think we ought to realize who we owe. And of course we owe everything to God. And we certainly ought to be debtor to live after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Amen? Let's pay our debt. Let's pay our debt. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music this evening, the good testimonies that we've heard. Thank you for Brother Jason and what you have done in his heart and life and what you're continuing to do in him and through him. I pray your continued blessing upon him. And Father, tonight we've turned our attention to this passage in Romans where Paul reminds us that we're all debtors. And Lord, as I went back through my life and recounted the people that have invested in me, to whom I owe a debt, Lord, I pray that others, as they sat there, were thought about people who've invested in their life and to whom they also owe a debt, that we would pay that debt and live our lives for others. As others live their lives and invested in us, we would invest our lives in others. Lord, if you choose to tarry your coming and we go the way of all men, I sure would like to leave behind some people that I invested in. I would say that maybe they'd stand up 20 years from now when I'm in glory and say, you know, Pastor Slaybaugh invested in me and I want to pay my debt. And so, Lord, I pray you'll speak to hearts this evening from the children in the room who owe a debt to parents and to Sunday school teachers and other influences in their life, godly grandparents, to even grandparents in the room tonight who say, I know I owe a debt to people who've invested in my life. And Lord, most of all, we bow our knee to you, for we owe it all to you. For without you, we're nothing. Speak to hearts, God. I trust you have. And help us to live our days realizing we're debtors and we want to pay our debt. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks tonight had say, Pastor, I, I realize that one day I owed a sin debt. And I realized one day somebody showed me from the Bible how Jesus paid the sin debt for me when he died on the cross. That if I by faith would accept Jesus Christ and his payment for my sin, I could have the gift of eternal life and go to heaven one day. And I bowed my head and from my heart I called on Jesus and asked him to be my Savior. And Pastor, I know my debt's been paid today and I know Jesus is my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up tonight and say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. Here's my hand as a testimony. God bless you. You may put it down. So somebody here tonight would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure that my debt's ever been paid, but I appreciate you praying for me. Would you slip your hand up tonight and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this evening? Fine. The message was two believers tonight. I wonder how many believers tonight would say, Pastor, I realize tonight I'm a debtor. Boy, there's people who've invested in my life through the years. Say, Pastor, as you were going through folks who influenced your life, God was showing me people who influenced mine, people who invested in me, and I realize I'm a debtor. I, I intend to live a life to pay my debt. Maybe God spoke to your heart and said, Preacher, I realize tonight I owe a debt, and I intend to pay my debt. And not only that, I want to so live a life where I invest in others as people invested in me so that I can reproduce in their life what people reproduced in mine. Pastor, God spoke to my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Take a few minutes and talk to him tonight.
bow the knee, spend time with God, tell him you'll pay the debt that he showed you that you owed. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. I pray your blessing now on this invitation. May your will be done in every heart and life. Lord, may each believer here tonight that you've spoken to their heart, may they respond and do what you're bidding them to do. And we'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond oh, to him this evening, will you? Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. That's right. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee my blessing. Blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for just a wonderful evening together, a wonderful day it's been, God. Thank you in the middle of the summertime, at the end of the summer here, Lord, and a hot day. Folks, faithful to be in the house of God on Sunday morning and Sunday night. Thank you for the wonderful testimonies this evening. Thank you again for Brother Jason and for what you you have done and what you are doing in his life. Thank you for, I appreciate him taking the time out of his schedule to drive up here and to speak to us this evening. May your hand of blessing continue on his life. May we hear great things in the days ahead of what you're doing in and through Jason Laypole. Thank you for the faithful men who go into the prisons every week and minister God's word through the RU program. May he continue to uh, change lives through the power of God's word. Thank you for what we've heard today. Thank you for your blessing upon our church. Lord, I pray that you'll dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful that you go with us from this place. Be with others in our church family that are traveling uh, this weekend or traveling back home. Please give them safety. Bring us back together, Lord, for the evening service on Wednesday. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Uh, Brother Danny, Brother Jason, why don't you take him to the back there so folks as they go, they can greet him and thank him for coming, get a chance to thank him for his testimony. Brother Jason, God bless you, brother. That's great. All right. Don't forget, you want to get a T-shirt, uh, get that ordered, see Brother Bob, and uh, at least get that, get that uh, on the works. Tell him what size and what color you want, and it uh, would be great to have dozens of people there with our T-shirts on. Uh, advertising the church amen and uh, that'll be good uh, how many are you gonna get one I'm gonna get one anybody else going one there yeah good good all right amen how many are you getting Rachel you say oh, yeah 15. yeah five ten fifteen all right if you need one see Rachel she's gonna have plenty all right all right it's a grand thing to be a Christian it's the best thing I know let's sing it together all right hey it's a grand thing to be a Christian it's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You're dismissed.